So when we look at our periodic table, we can subcategorize it okay, according to uh, the different types of elements, be it metals or nonmetals, which is the staircase on our periodic table. Some periodic tables accent that staircase more than others. Thankfully, the one in our room does. Uh, I can't remember for certain if the one on your exam does or not. Uh, I'll try and make sure it is at least accented. Um, so to the left of that staircase, you are defined as a metal. To the right of that staircase, you're a non-metal. So if we go through and compare characteristics, almost all of our metals are solids. Okay? And almost all of our non-metals are solids or gases. Okay? I always find that kind of annoying because, well, there's really only three phases that we're used to dealing with, and we're saying non-metals can be two of those three. So that doesn't really help us classify. Okay. Um, that information would be nice if it was stored on the periodic table. Is it? Right, you look at it, you don't see anything that says solid unless you pull out a magnifying glass potentially and look, oh, actually right down at the bottom it says solid here. What does it say next to the word solid? And don't tell me red. The other direction. It says black. What does that mean? Any element that is black on our periodic table is a solid. The information is on the periodic table. Okay, notice if we look at all the other elements, we have some other colors popping up. We have red, uh, and if you're colorblind, I apologize. Or was it, can you be blue colorblind? Okay. Whether you're colorblind or not, it's not easy to see the blue on there, but there are two elements that are blue on our periodic table. The blue ones on the periodic table are liquids, there's only two of them, and then the red ones are gases. All right, so we do have phase information for the elements on our periodic table, which is kind of nice. The next kind of list of things become a little bit more difficult to process. All of those are kind of what they actually look like. The only way we'd see that on the periodic table is if they gave us pictures of them, and they don't. Okay? Um, at least not on simple, simplified ones. So luster, is it shiny? Okay. Versus non-metals being dull, they don't shine. Okay. Malleability versus brittle ability uh, has to do with if you hit it. Okay. If you hit a metal, it kind of bends and shapes around that impact. Whereas a non-metal, when you hit it, it tends to shatter. Okay. So you've hit... Uh, Charcoal briquettes are, for the most part, carbon, which is a non-metal because it's on the right of that staircase. <coughs> so when we hit those, what happens? They shatter. Right? But if we hit uh, gold, probably the best example, though most people don't hit gold. Uh, if we hit gold, we would see it just kind of deform okay, and misshape. Um, conduction. This is a big one. Your metals conduct heat and electricity, whereas the non-metals do not. Okay, we could refer to it as non-conduction. What's another term? Any ideas? Non-conduction is a pretty horrible word for that. Insulation. Yeah, an insulator. Okay, it insulates, it prevents the passage of heat or electricity. Then we can look at densities. Densities are now looking at kind of a measurement. Melting points, measurements as well. And then reactivities. <coughs> When we look at our reactivities, that's again, we now have to run a chemical reaction. That's not going to be an easy thing to put on the periodic table. But those are our general kind of classifications. Notice there are some overlap, but for the most part, they're largely different, and we can take advantage of those differences. Okay? The biggest difference that I would say you might need to retain for information would be looking at potentially your gases showing up, so phase differences. And then also kind of this middle one here, because that one's a pretty big difference. <coughs> Anything where you have extreme differences between them, those are going to be useful. Okay, the conducting heat and electricity becomes important because we'll talk about the ability for a material to conduct <coughs> heat in a general sense later on in the semester that's going to come back to the same concept. Okay. What happens with, well, let's just take a look at our pictures. What do you think we have pictures of up there? Now we have pictures of some elements. Any guesses? What do you think? Metals? Non-metals? Why do you think metals? Well, I think the one 
I think I don't think the one on the right is a metal. I don't know. I may be wrong. But okay. No, that's fine. Why? Because that does not look like metal to me. From my experience. So what looks like a metal? That's a good point. That, the one on the left. So what are you seeing that says that looks like a metal? Because you're just saying, well, look at that for yourself, and that looks like a metal. It's, Don't it's just shiny. shiny. Okay, that's looking at our luster. Okay, how does it appear? That's our luster. It's shiny. Okay? and if we take a look at those, those all look pretty shiny. That one's not shiny. Not really. That one's on the acid trip. <laughs> <laughs> this one is technically shiny, it's just absorbing and reflecting different colors of light, which is why we're seeing that kind of iridescent color associated with it. Some materials will do that. That's why it's thrown on there, because it's trying to be confusing. Yeah, all of those are examples of metals. Right? Typically, our metals are silver or white-ish, but that's not always true. Right? Uh, what's the, let's just see how many people are chefs, uh, what's the most ideal pot to buy? Uh, we got to be careful, I guess, with that statement. Thank you for answering the nonstick. Um, material used to make a pot. Okay, we're hearing iron, stainless steel. Cast iron. Cast iron. Copper is usually one of the best materials. Okay, what's the issue with a copper pot? How many of you own a copper pot? Yeah. Why is only one person raising their hand with copper pots and nobody else is? I know how to cook too, and I want a copper pot, but I don't have one. Yeah, copper's really expensive, but it conducts heat magnificently. So you put a little bit of heat on one end of the pot because you have a cheap stove, what happens? The heat completely dissipates through the entire pot, and it cooks evenly. Whereas a stainless steel, um, which sometimes aren't that bad, or some of the iron ones, don't distribute the heat quite as well. They don't conduct heat quite as evenly, which means if I heat at one point, I get a hot spot, and I end up burning my food at that point, whereas another part of the pot doesn't cook the food at all. So copper conducts heat very, very well, but it tends to be expensive. Okay? Copper is a metal. What color is copper? And thank you for those people saying, well, it's copper. Thank you. <laughs> it's kind of an orange, reddish brown. That's not silver. Okay? So the color doesn't necessarily mean it's a metal. Okay? Another example, jewelry. Okay? Anybody have anything that made of gold? Well, gold's a metal. It's not silver. Okay? Or that gray color. So the color can be misleading within this, so be a little bit careful with that. Notice that we don't actually say colors within this list. Yeah? What is that far right one? Uh, that far right one would be bismuth. Yeah? What do you use to make bismuth? So that would be a good question to write up in a report. Get out of here, people. Uh, so yeah, if you want to know what those ones are, they're actually in the notes on the slides. I don't recognize them by sight. Uh, the far left is potassium, followed by molybdenum, ruthenium, <coughs> and then bismuth. I think. I'm not sure how much I trust that, but let's just say that's true for the moment. Okay. Um, what about these? <coughs> What do you think? Metals, non-metals, <coughs> metalloids. All right, for them to be metals, they should be mostly solids. Okay. The outer two look like solids. The inner two definitely don't look like solids. Okay. That could be misleading because it says mostly solids. Okay. Luster, that means they're shiny. Is that first one? Particularly shiny? Not really. The next one's a liquid, so that becomes difficult to call shiny. Okay? But it's a dark red brown, so it's not really shiny. That next one's a bit misleading. Okay? What that actually is is a tube with the element inside it that then has 20,000 volts running through it. Okay? That causes it to get super excited and glow that color. Okay? 
So what we're looking at is a gas in that case. Are any of our metals gases? No. So if we've got a gas, more than likely we're looking at our nonmetals. And then the last one, again, kind of misleading with a little bit of shine there, but not really lustrous either. All of these are nonmetals. Anybody recognize any of them? What's that? Hydrogen's not a bad guess for the gas, uh, though I don't think it's hydrogen, it's argon. Far right, does that material look familiar to anybody? Engineers? It's carbon. It's a carbon fiber weave. Uh, I doubt anyone would get the first one, because I wouldn't. That's selenium. And then the middle one, or the brownish red one. What phase is it? A liquid. Remember, there were only two liquids on the periodic table. And we now know that this liquid is a non-metal. How do we know? Uh, so I've seen several people look at the periodic table, which is a good choice. How do we know we have a liquid? It's blue. Okay, mercury is one option. What's the symbol for mercury? HG. Where is HG according to that staircase? <laughs> Left or right of it? Left, which makes it a metal. So that doesn't work. <coughs> BR, which is bromine. Okay, so yeah, that brownish one is bromine liquid. What do you think about these? Why are you saying metalloids? They look shiny and solids to me. Because we've gone through metals and <laughs> There's your best bet. We've gone through the other ones. The other properties of our metalloids aren't going to be visible. That's looking at the other ones. How they conduct electricity, their densities, or their melting points, um, or even their reactivity. Those aren't going to be things that we can visually see, so those are going to be a bit misleading for us to nail down. Uh, just for the heck of it, that's left to right. Uh, Antimony, silicon, and polonium. Yeah. Okay, just so you know. So, we encountered a couple issues. That last one with mercury and bromine. And mercury, we said the symbol was HG, and bromine, we said was BR. Okay, the bromine made kind of sense because bromine sounds kind of like BR, elicits that symbol. Uh, but mercury is not spelled with a silent H or a silent G. So where is that symbol coming from for Mercury? It's a Latin or Greek or German or whatever the heck they felt like okay, root. So some of the symbols that come off our periodic table make sense from the name. Some of them do not. This is why you have to spend some time to go through and memorize the pairing between the name and the symbol. Okay. Unfortunately, the reference listed up there isn't, oh, actually, I fixed it. Files, references, elements for memory. You've all found that, and you've all started working on trying to memorize that. Of course. Of course. Okay, so let's do some tests. Wow. I said started, not... <laughs> well, so what is the symbol for... Nickel. Okay. So I heard N and I heard NI. Why did you say N? Because it be, uh, I didn't ask what N stood for. I said, why did you say N for nickel? Because nickel begins with N. A couple people were like, well, but there's some other elements that begin with N, and I know what N is, so it can't be N. I'm going to call it NI. Why did you say NI? the next letter in the word. Both of those are reasonable guesses. Okay. What's the symbol for nitrogen? N. N. This is a very common one to ask on a test question. Why? <coughs> Both of these begin with N-I. Okay. So if you just go through and say, well, I don't really need to memorize them because it's just the first letter. Mm, no. 
oh, I don't really need to memorize them because it's just the first two letters. Eh, no. Okay? So you have to be a little bit careful with how you go through and apply these. Okay? Let's throw in another N one, why not? <coughs> Sodium. Spelled N A O D I M. What? Why did that happen? Okay. They're crazy, that's fine. It comes from different languages. The periodic table is an amalgam of all cultures that have gone through and found these elements. Depending on who discovered it and their country of origin, they got to decide what to name it and the symbol associated with it. So some of those symbols make sense to us because they have an English root. Some of them do not. Okay? For instance, sodium was an older one. I don't remember the country of origin for that. But that comes from the word natrium. And that's why they use N-A. Because in one other language, at least, the name for sodium is not sodium. It's actually natrium. Okay? So we have to be a little bit careful with the memorization. This is, or with just saying it's that first letter. Okay? That's why you need to spend some time memorizing what those letters are and what they match to. Right, as far as those symbols go. Make sense? Okay. Are there any up there that you want to ask questions about? Curious about? No? Okay. We'll throw in another one that tends to throw people for a loop. Whoops. Let's take a look at phosphorus and potassium. Another unfortunate one because they're both P. So we can say PO and PH. That way we're clear. Well, there's no PH, dang it. And there is a PO. Maybe that's it. Except the PO belongs to. Oops. Did I spell that right? Where'd it go? Yep, I got it right. So the PO belongs to polonium. So potassium ends up being K, phosphorus, P. Okay. So spend some time practicing these. Remember, within that file, the bold ones, you absolutely need to know. You will see those this semester. Okay. Those also, I think, tend to be the ones that people can learn relatively quickly. Okay, the other ones, some of them kind of stand out and become difficult to memorize. Okay? This could be a question of flashcards. Okay? I can't usually, or I don't usually recommend flashcards, but for just rote memorization, it's not bad. Okay? Start cycling through. If you know it, move it out of that pile. Move it out of your bulk pile. Okay? If you don't know it, that stays in until you've got it nailed down. And then slowly start shuffling them back together. Okay? Start working on this sooner rather than later. Okay. I believe this is the periodic table that you get on your exam. We'll draw attention to a couple other things that might be a bit questionable on it. Does anybody know anything that's, or notice anything that's missing from this periodic table that shows up on the periodic tables on the wall? The bold line to separate isn't there. So what I will try to do, if it's not on the actual version, is go back through and try and bold that line out. It is just kind of a nice staircase all the way down. But I'll try and make sure that's bolded in so you don't have to worry about it. So you don't have to be looking across the room. What else is missing from it? We don't have any of the colors. Printing color is expensive, so I don't print color. But what I will go through and do is define a symbol. Okay. I think I have X's and O's, and I don't remember exactly which one's which. But I'll say O's are solids and X's are liquids or something like that. And then I will have that marked. Sorry, not solids. Gases. And then I'll have that marked in the upper right-hand corner. 
Okay. And I just now realized also that this absolutely will not be the periodic table on your exam. Any ideas why? It's missing SC and Y. In the uh, it's technically not missing them. Oh, it just doesn't play. They offset them. Okay. Oh. And when we talk about the periodic table, we'll talk about why they offset them. But it has to do with how they fill, okay, or how, how the periodic table is organized. So they are still there. So there is some that are missing as far as labels. Any ideas why I'm not even going to worry about those? On our periodic table, what is the extra thing? We have black, we have red, we have blue. And we have the outline. What did the outline mean? Synthetically prepared. That means somebody in a lab smashed atoms together and made an atom. Okay, we can do that. It's kind of neat. Okay, the reason why we won't worry about those is because it's not so much that they're not natural or man-made. What are the odds you are going to work with any of those? Okay, you're not. Okay, um, you're talking about probably billion-dollar facilities to smash those atoms. Okay, we don't have that. Okay, and you probably won't get access to any of that. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to stress about those. Anybody notice anything else on this periodic table that's not on this one? Yeah, it has the names. You're like, I'm not going to bother to memorize the names. You're going to give me all the names. No, I'm not. Okay, and the names will not be on your exam. If you're curious what that periodic table looks like, download the first practice exam. Okay, the periodic table is part of that. Hi. Questions about that? Let's advance. Okay, so we'll jump now. Pretty big jump into chapter four. So we only talked about the first couple sections of chapter three, and now we're going to launch all the way into chapter four, which is actually looking at atomic theory. Okay, there is lots of memorization within this unit because it's now about facts and a little bit of history behind where the structure of our atoms come from. Okay, so it makes sense to go through and start early. Okay. Dalton is the first name that we're going to come across. Okay. The reason we highlight Dalton is he was, in the early 1800s, one of the first scientists to go through and establish a rule set for what defined chemistry. What are the pieces that we're looking at when we look at chemistry? Okay. And he came up with five rules for what are atoms and what those things mean. So he started to subdivide categories of what we not found in nature and broke them down into their tiniest pieces. Those tiniest pieces he then published and organized as shown. That's the picture on the right. Okay, anybody notice anything weird about that in comparison to what we have on our walls? Yeah, instead of using letters, he used symbols. Okay, why? Because he was a really good artist, I don't know. Okay. If we try to build what we know of molecules now using those symbols, it's going to be awful. Okay. You can already start to see when he goes through and starts to build larger molecules at the bottom that that gets really ugly really fast. Well, he actually made it look kind of pretty, but... For us to go through and draw all that is not going to be fun. Right? It's going to be insanely time consuming. That's why we shift to the symbols. Okay? You'll also notice that if we take a look at his periodic table, he stops pretty much at this top part. The rest of those are then molecules. We know they're molecules because they have multiple circles. So there's multiple atoms. So his elements are just that top. What is that? 20-ish elements? Why does he only have 20 and we have 118? That's all that they have access to at that time. Okay? To identify and name an element, it must be pure. It has to be removed from everything else. Okay? So those 20 happen to be the easiest to isolate and get away from everything else. So that's how he ended up with those 20. As we continue through, we find that there's holes in our periodic table or there's holes in our understanding, and we start to be able to isolate more and more. Right? 
Within the rules, just based off of those 20, he came up with five rules. An element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. So he's now defined what an atom is. Okay? All those things, his 20, are now atoms. And he said, those do not break apart. Whereas molecules, we could break apart. May not be easy, but we can separate those molecules down into these tinier pieces called atoms. Okay? All atoms of an individual element are identical and have the same properties. So I could take oxygen from water and oxygen from carbon dioxide, and as long as I got the oxygen together, all of those oxygen atoms would have the same properties. Even though, when I look at water versus carbon dioxide, they have drastically different properties, right? Carbon dioxide is a gas and water is a liquid. So what they're bonded to changes the properties. But if I have an element, regardless of its source, it'll always have the same properties. Rule three, atoms of different elements will combine to form compounds. That's why I can take, to make water, take oxygen and hydrogen, and I get water. Or I can take oxygen and carbon and make carbon dioxide. Those will now be distinct compounds because that secondary element, hydrogen or carbon, changes the properties and we get different compounds. Right. Four, compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. Okay. I can't break apart carbon to get half a carbon in a molecule. Okay. This goes back to rule one. Atoms are indestructible. Okay. So what he's saying is that these have to be whole numbers. I can't break them into fractional pieces to build them up. And then five... Atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. Okay, so let's start at the bottom and work our way up. What is our formula for water? H2O. H2O. Okay, so what rule five is saying is that I can take a different amount of hydrogens with a different amount of oxygens to create a different compound. So I could take still two hydrogens, but now two oxygens. That's an O. And I would have a different compound. Is that true? Yeah. Water, I need to live. Hydrogen peroxide kind of kills me. Okay. Drastically different chemical properties, and all we've done is change one atom. Okay. There's a horrible joke about walking into a bar. You haven't heard it, you're lucky. If you really want to hear it, you can talk to me after class. <laughs> Compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. Right? When we look even at the examples for five, H2O and H2O2, notice that it's not H a half and O a half. Okay? Those have to be whole number ratios. The numbers associated with those will always be one, two, three, four, five. Okay? We cannot break our atoms apart to make a compound. There isn't really an example I can do for that. It just because there is no opposite. Okay? You can't do it. Atoms of different elements will combine to form compounds. Well, if I take hydrogen and oxygen and put them together, I can make water. So I can form compounds by combining those different atoms. So that's valid. All atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. Okay? So if I take a hydrogen and I take another hydrogen, those atoms will always be the same. Well, that's a trickier one. Turns out that's not true. Right, why? Well, we haven't talked about atomic structure yet, so you may not know. So rule two, invalid. It right, doesn't work. Because I can select two different hydrogen atoms that have different properties. Right, it is possible to do Okay. Rule number one, an element is composed of tiny indivisible particles called atoms. Okay. That means if I take a hydrogen atom, it cannot be destroyed. It cannot be turned into anything else. Is that one true? Okay. I'm kind of hoping we have a little bit more knowledge on that one. That one is definitely not true. Okay. Protons, electrons, neutrons, quarks. Okay. We'll never talk about quarks. But you may have heard of these other kind of particles. Okay? Atoms can be taken apart. And they can be broken down into our subatomic particles. 
sub being smaller than atomic particles. So when we look at this list, we're like, well, his first two rules were entirely wrong. Now, why would we ever acknowledge Dalton? 1800s, right? 200 years ago, if my math serves me. Right? That's a really long time ago, and what he's done is come up with predictions that allow us to now build things. That's pretty cool. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we acknowledge his discoveries. He's also kind of a cool scientist, colorblind. Okay? He's come up with a bunch of different observations of things in the world, too. Okay? So those are Dalton's rules. We will keep coming back to those, particularly as we learn the details of how he failed. Okay? We now push 100 years later, and we encounter Thompson. Okay? Thompson's really famous for his model of the atom, though it's a bit unfortunate because his model of the atom is actually wrong. Right? Really what we should be remembering Thompson for is not his failure of the model of the atom, but really his discovery that atoms have smaller particles. Right? And this ultimately came through kind of a cascade of effects or observations largely located around radiation okay? or nuclear radiation. So what he was able to discover directly was the existence of a, what he called an electron. Actually, I think he called it something else. But what we now assign as our electrons. And really what it was is that he noticed a charged particle. Okay? Because he's now noticed a charged particle coming from something that did not have charge, he's now indirectly able to say there's a second particle. That second particle must be the opposite charge of the first so that they would then cancel out. So he ends up with two particles, uh, the electron and the proton, where the proton is positively charged and the electron is negatively charged. Make sense so far? Okay. I think this is kind of neat to be able to, to figure this out. Okay. And I wondered why it took 100 years to figure this out. What was this discovery based off of? Yes, we needed to find radioactivity and things like that or start to explore radioactivity. But there was a pretty massive discovery that needed to happen before we could do electrons. Kind of a bizarrely simple thing that theoretically we use every couple weeks, maybe. A vacuum cleaner. Okay. Really, what we needed was a vacuum. Right? Without a vacuum, we can't make the discovery of electrons or protons. Because even with electricity, we can just say, well, there's charged particles. I don't know where those charged particles are coming from, but it must be an element that's a charged particle. So when I have electricity, there's an element that is causing electricity. That's not the case. Right? Electricity is being caused by the pieces that make up the elements. Right? Electrons. Well, it turns out that those charged particles are inherently unstable and so do not exist on their own. Okay, this is a good thing because out of our wall, we're getting electricity. We put electric current in there or energy behind it to release electrons out. Okay? And we know that it's good that it's locked in the wall and that it's not a stable thing because if I stuck my finger in that electrical outlet, what happens? I get shocked, right? Or a fork in there. Okay. And the electricity then runs through my body, hits the ground, okay, and I get zapped very painfully. Okay. Do not do this, by the way. Okay. It's not particularly pleasant. So electrons are very high energy and very reactive. Okay. If they existed on, your, on their own, imagine just walking down the street and all of a sudden being shocked by sticking your finger in an electrical outlet, but you're just touching the air. That becomes a bit problematic. Okay. That could make for a very exciting lifestyle. <laughs> do, do, oop. Oh, yeah, hi. How are you going? Okay. Um, I could explain a lot of bizarre behaviors, too. Um, so it all came down to the vacuum. And so the whole point of that is that I could take a chamber and I could remove everything from that chamber. So now there's nothing inside it. Okay. There's no air. Okay. Now when I put an electrical voltage behind it, it'd be like, well, can the electricity... Right? Is, can my element of electricity do anything in that space? Right? So I can establish a voltage or a parameter there to try and get the electric electricity to jump. 
Well, if there's nothing there, what should happen? Nothing. There's no matter. There aren't the atoms that make electricity, so it can't move. Okay? But if we crank the voltage high enough, what ends up happening is we see something. Okay? We can see the tube glow. Okay? We can see a beam if we're really lucky. Okay? And the extra fun thing with that beam is they're like, well, what happens if I put a magnet near it? Well, I put a magnet near it, what happened to the beam? It moved. Well, why would it move from the magnet? Well, what does a magnet have? A north pole and a south pole. It's composed of two opposites. What's the opposite of a negative? Positive. We have two opposites. So if we now move a magnet near this, our beam will move either towards or away from the magnet, suggesting that whatever that particle is has some kind of polarity associated with it. That's how we can determine this charge. Okay. Historically, this observation is actually really neat. He called it a cathode ray okay, or a cathode ray gun. Okay. It's also a tube. So if we actually put, all, put that all together, we have a cathode ray tube, also known as a CRT, also known as when we collect like thousands of these together. A TV. Okay. Cathode ray tubes, this is the origin of our TVs, okay. which we've now all thrown away because those are massive. Okay. And we've adapted our technology to be better than that. Okay. But Thompson took this information and said, atoms now have negative and positive. Well, I'm going to now define the atom better than what Dalton did. Dalton said you couldn't break them apart. Thompson proves, yes, you can break them apart. They have to be composed of these negative and positive things. Okay? So his theory is that these negative things are sitting inside the atom. Okay? The atom is just this sphere of positive charge, and the negative things just kind of swim around in it. And if I put enough energy in, those electrons can jump out, and that's what we can then detect. Okay? This is known as the plum pudding model. Because he said the electrons were plum floating in the pudding of the atom. Okay. I don't think I've ever had plum pudding, but if anybody's had it, that's his model of the atom. Okay. So everybody likes to associate the plum pudding model with Thompson, probably because we can all point and laugh at him. That's a bit unfortunate, okay, because this is a pretty solid discovery. <coughs> okay. And that discovery is really back to the electrons. Okay. Some other things that come out of this, he can really only calculate the mass to charge ratio for those individual particles. So he doesn't know the exact mass or the exact charge. He just knows that the particle has some negative charge and the relationship between that negative charge and the mass he can define. That's it. But he doesn't know what the exact mass is. Okay. So this one's not in the textbook, but I like talking about it because it's kind of neat. You get Millikan and Fletcher, about 1911, okay, went through and they defined the exact charge on the electron. That's about the extent that I want you to get with that, sort of. Okay. I don't want you to memorize the exact charge. Notice it's listed down there. Don't worry about that number. That's just what it is so you get an idea of, holy crap, that's really hard. Okay, but that's about it. Okay. How did they come up with and do this? Well, they have to be able to define what the actual mass of the electron is, okay, or get some measurement of the mass, and they have to be able to know its charge, okay, or that relationship between them. So this means isolating, effectively, a single electron. Okay, well, electrons are insanely tiny, okay, so tiny we can't see them. So how are they able to do this? Okay, well, what they went through and did is kind of took advantage of static electricity. If we take oil and then spray that oil, the action of the oil moving generates an a static charge on each of those oil droplets. Right? But if you've done that with perfume or anything like that, you see tons of droplets. It's really hard to individually grab. You can't like grab one of those droplets. Okay? So not easy. Okay? And if we did a whole bunch of them, it's not going to be easy to grab a single one. Even if I could grab one, how do I grab that one and not all the others that are in the way? Right? So what they did is built a box around their spray, 
and they would just spray into the box. Well, what are the droplets going to do? Fall. Why would they fall? You can thank Newton for us. Gravity. <coughs> Gravity causes the droplets to fall. Well, on the bottom of that box, they cut a tiny hole. Okay? A hole so tiny that it would only capture a single droplet, or the odds are that it would only capture a single droplet, which means that single droplet falls into that hole. Meanwhile, some poor sap, which I believe was actually Fletcher, has a microscope aimed down the chamber at that hole. Okay? So he can see in there and see the droplet come through the hole. Okay? The instant the droplet comes through the hole, he starts playing with a little dial. That dial changes the electric current on either side of the hole. Okay? Remember, the droplet is charged. If I now make the bottom of my plate negatively charged, what happens when the negative drop gets near the negative plate? It repels, and it will actively move away from the plate. Right? If, it does it, if he's got it too charged, what happens? The droplet goes flying away from the plate, and we lose it. Right? But if he does it just right, what happens? It'll stay and the droplet will hover in the exact same spot. <laughs> At that point, he can then go through and visually, based off of microscopy and, and optics, I'll get you in a second, visually measure the size of the droplet. He also knows, thanks to Newton, the downward force from gravity. So he knows the mass of the particle, he knows the downward force, and he knows the electric current pushing it up. He can then solve for the charge of the individual particle against that current. Those of you going, that sounds like a lot of calculations. That's because it is. Okay. And if we scale that out, it's on an insanely tiny droplet that we can barely see with our eyes. If we take a look at the size of this number. This is 10 to the negative 19. That's insanely tiny. Okay. If you just tried to measure a millimeter, Right, or we gave out this pen and had somebody, each of you try to measure it, you would probably all measure pretty close, probably maybe negative one accuracy on the pen. He's at negative 19. Okay. That's a an pretty impressive feat. Okay. Yes, your question? Okay. Which gets kind of to the next point. How long behind this? Well, this is science. This is probably a matter of five or six years designing the experiment and testing it. Okay? If there's lots of error in that experiment, how do we minimize that human error? By retesting it. Okay? But that one also has error, so how do we minimize that error? Retest it. So they're probably testing this hundreds of times and then averaging all of those results to get something like this. Okay? So that is science. Okay. Painfully tedious, but we go through and we measure and we measure, and then everybody gets to remember your name associated with this. Unfortunately, we really only memorize one name with this oil drop experiment. It's typically Millikan. Okay. So let's put it to the class. Let's say I was Millikan and you were Fletcher. You went through and did this experiment. Okay. I was the guy that organized it. I told you that you needed to do this. You set it out and said, okay, I'm going to go through this process. I'm going to do all this work. You show me the results. I go, yeah, that's pretty good results. I'm going to go publish this. My name gets attached to it. What happens to your name? Well, you're a student. You don't deserve any credit. Okay. And what happens? Millikan gets all the credit for this. Okay. This is science. You think about all your famous scientists that you've ever heard of. For a lot of cases... It was really a graduate student working for that scientist that made the discovery. But it was the original scientist that gets most of the credit. They were the ones that supported the student, went out, found the money to support to make sure the student could do the work. Okay. They went out and said, hey, here's a good student. I think you should try something like this, figure it out. Okay. So they were effectively the brain behind the action. So they do deserve a lot of credit. Okay. But very often, the workers, the graduate students, okay, don't get very much. Okay. 
And in this case, Fletcher fully acknowledges and says it's not a big deal. That's the way science works. Right? And it is, unfortunately, the way science works. It is rare to find an actual professor that will accept student work and give them credit for it. Right? Comes down to just what happens. Okay? But what comes out of this? Well, Milliken gets a Nobel Prize. Fletcher doesn't get anything. Okay? The Nobel Prize comes with a million-dollar purse. Okay? Uh, Fletcher doesn't get any credit directly. But now Fletcher goes out to find a job somewhere at a different university. And what do all the universities do? They pay him a lot more because they know he's tied to this research. Right? So now Fletcher has a, kind of a reputation through the names associated with it, and he can go on to make his own discoveries right? and have job security behind it. Okay. What's that? And profit off of his students. And profit off of his students and propagate the system further on down the line. Yep. Okay. So if you move into science, and this is not just chemistry, this is all science, this is how they do it. Okay. A lot of it comes down to who's that person in charge and how do they support. Okay. Sometimes they support really well, sometimes they don't. Okay. It just kind of comes down to the different situation. This, again, does not mean that Milliken was a lazy person. Insanely brilliant. He was probably the one that helped design this and say this is something that you should be looking at, that this is likely to work. Figure it out. Okay. And they would meet and talk about it, but Fletcher was the one looking through the, the microscope, probably losing eyesight. Okay. So what I want you to get out of this one, Milliken and Fletcher, oil drop experiment, charge on an electron. Okay. This then kind of takes us into Rutherford, okay, which is the next big one here. Rutherford is now famous for his model of the atom because it's a more appropriate model of the atom. Okay. Remember, what we had at this point was the plum pudding model. Okay. Our understanding of atoms was based off of a dessert. Okay. And in that model, we hadn't proved anything yet. It was just a, an attempted theory. It supported the evidence that we had at that point, but we hadn't had anything to disprove that theory or not. That's where Rutherford comes in. Okay. Rutherford came through and said, well, I'm going to take a thin sheet of gold foil. Okay. And gold, if you pound it thin enough, does allow light to pass through it. Okay. So things can pass through this. Okay. And so what he went through and did was fired alpha particles, which are a form of radiation which we'll talk about in a second, okay, at this gold foil. Alpha particles were known to have some mass. Okay. If Thompson's model is valid, where everything is just a sea of pretty much nothingness, what happens when the alpha particles impact the atom? Well, if there's nothing there, what happens? It passes straight through. And so what Rutherford is doing by this is saying, well, let's find out that Thompson's model is correct. Let's fire some stuff at our atoms and see what happens. So he sets up a detector on the other end of that gold foil. The alpha particles come in, go through the gold foil, and they impact the detector. If Thompson's model is correct, all we see are impacts on the other end of the gold foil. Okay. We might expect some deviation, that's okay, but for the most part, they should all impact directly there. And this is where I used to like to say that Rutherford didn't like Thompson, which is entirely not true. They were like best friends. Rutherford was actually a student of Thompson. Okay. That whole teacher-student relationship. Okay. He put the detector all the way around the gold foil. Why would you put it all the way around the gold foil? What if Thompson's model is wrong? What if when it hits the gold foil, it hits something solid? What would happen to the particle? It should bounce. It should ricochet off. So he puts the detector around it, and he notices that, yep, Thompson, you're absolutely right. For the most part, there isn't anything there. It just passes straight through and it hits the detector. But Thompson, you're also wrong. 
Because every so often, I see something bouncing backwards, which makes absolutely no sense with his model. So Arthur said, well, mostly your model is correct. Most of the atom has nothing in it. Okay? But the atom definitely has something in it. Okay? That's something I'm going to call a nucleus. And what that nucleus is going to be is all of the positively charged particles that Thompson said were just the floating C. All those positive charged particles are now going to be combined into a super dense nucleus and be jammed together. Okay? That's going to define the mass for the individual element. Sort of. Okay. Anybody see an issue potentially popping up with this model? What did the electron do when it got near another electron electric plate? It repelled. Like charges repel away from each other. I take the north end of a magnet near the north end, they repel. Okay. Well, what charge was a proton? Positive. What charge is a second proton? Positive. What happens if I take those two positives and I put them near each other? They repel. So Rutherford says this has to be true. All of those positive charges have to be mashed together next to each other. Well, if that's the case, something has to hold those positive charges there. So Thompson said, here are electrons, here's my theory based on that. Rutherford said, your theory is wrong. Here's where my theory is. Not only do we have these electrons and protons, but we have to have another particle that holds all those protons in the nucleus. Because otherwise, they would repel away from each other. And he theorizes the existence of a neutron. And that's where we get our three subatomic particles. Okay? So let's take a step back for more history on this. What is an alpha particle? Alpha particle is nuclear radiation. Okay. Some elements are radioactive. They're unstable and they fall apart. And in the process of falling apart, they emit some types of particles. Okay. One of those particles is an alpha particle. Okay. They happen to have mass, okay, and they also happen to have a positive charge. Okay. For this experiment to work, I have to trust that what's coming out of this is alpha particles. Right? Because if peanut butter is flying out of this, all it's going to do is coat the plate, and now it's, that doesn't make any sense. Like, of course it's going to bounce. You can't see through peanut butter. Right? So I need to make sure the only thing coming out of that is alpha particles, which means my source of alpha particles had better be super, super clean, okay? super, super pure, which means I have to have an ideal clean source. I have to have an element that's pure all on its own. Remember, 100 years before this, we had Dalton with how many elements? 20. Why did he not have 118? Really hard to separate elements away from each other. Okay. It's also really hard to separate elements away from the decomposition products of that nuclear radiation. So his whole experiment hinges on that source. Okay, well, where do you get that source? You have to find it. Not only do you have to find it, you have to separate it from everything else that's near it. Okay, well, that takes time, that takes science, that takes effort. Who made that effort? Let's see, I don't think I put her name on here. That's kind of bad of me. Curie. Everybody's heard of Madame Curie? Yeah. Curie was the one that was able to generate this source. She went through and studied radioactive particles and was able to isolate several samples. Okay. Radium was one, uh, and polonium was another one. Okay. This is a woman, by the way, Madame, kind of gives that away. 1900s, early 1900s. This is the turn of that century. Okay. Could she vote? No. Does she have any rights? No. no. And yet she goes through and is somehow able to discover an element, isolate it from all the other crap. Remember, it's constantly falling apart. 
So we have to remove all that other crap as it's happening and then shared that with Rutherford so that he could go through and design this experiment. Okay. I make a big discovery right now. What do I do with that discovery? Poof, cure to cancer. Just came to me. Got it. Go to the lab, solved it. There it is. In this vial, I have, in my hand, I have the cure to cancer. What do I do with that cure? Make money. Okay. Patent it. I patent the crap out of it or trademark it. Okay, why? So no one else can use it so that I can sell it and make tons and tons of money. Okay. Oh, we need to do that so we can make money and, or so that we can continue to propagate science. Curie didn't patent it. She instead made that open access so that everybody had access to that procedure. If somebody asked for pure samples, she just provided it up. Okay. So that in and of itself is pretty awesome. Okay. She didn't limit or hinder science by giving everybody, or by holding it back and making people pay for it, okay, excessive amounts for it, but gave everybody open access to that knowledge. That's pretty awesome. Remember, and this isn't that people were like, you're a woman, I'm just going to steal it from you. This was literally her saying, no, here, take this. This is useful. Okay. If we add to that some other kind of interesting facts, okay, uh, let's get to the level of things that she wasn't allowed to do. Every nation usually has a collection of scientists that get together and say, we are the coolest scientists. Everybody has to come through us. Okay, she worked in France, so there's the French National Academy of Sciences. Could be saying that one wrong, but let's just say that's the name of it for the moment. Okay. Well, they all got together and they said, and Curie was like, look, look at all this cool stuff I did. You should let me join. And they said, no. Well, why not? You're a woman. Yeah, literally, you're a woman. No, you can't do that. Okay. So she wasn't allowed into the National Academy of Sciences for France because she was a woman. Okay. Discovers the thing that allows Rutherford to function and prove that we know what an atom is, and she isn't allowed in. Okay. That's kind of crappy. Okay. At least the whole world wasn't completely oblivious to her knowledge because she did receive a Nobel Prize. Okay. She purified radium, I think was the first one she got a Nobel Prize on, and so she got her million dollars and a big, nice gold medal. Woohoo, cool. Okay, but lots of people get Nobel Prizes. She's got two, actually, because they gave her another one. Anybody know how many people have two Nobel Prizes? Two. How many people have two Nobel Prizes in science fields? One. Curie. Curie is the only person to have achieved two Nobel Prizes in a science field ever, okay, and couldn't vote. What still wasn't allowed into the National Academy of Sciences in her country, okay? So I like to share this story because we've excluded for a large time certain parts of our population because we didn't think they had value to contribute. That is inherently a false statement. Okay. Everybody has something to contribute. You just may not know it yet. It's a question of working through and having access to that information. Okay. So Curie, to me, is a very inspirational story for going through and doing that. She's also incredibly stupid. Because how did she die? Radiation, Radiation poisoning. Okay. Cancer caused from radiation poisoning. Why? Well, look at this cool glowy thing. I'm going to store it in my pocket. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Okay. When we talk about safety in lab, and we'll look at a lab safety video this week, they talk about don't ever mouth pipette okay, or taste chemicals. You're like, why the hell would you ever put that in a video? Isn't that just common sense? Nope. Okay. Probably 40 years ago, there were, and there probably still are, chemistry instructors that proved that their students made the right thing by tasting the chemicals that were produced. Okay. There's a reason why scientists are kind of stupid okay, and brilliant at the same time. It's that kind of egomania of, I'm Superman, I'm a genius, I can taste chemicals and they aren't going to hurt me. It's not true. Chemicals hurt everybody equally. Okay. So just because we think we're doing well doesn't mean we can't get smacked as well. Okay? So Curie ended up dying due to that radiation poisoning. Okay?
kind of neat. Not the deaths part, but like the discovery parts. Right. I mean, it was 1900, so it probably would have been dead anyway. Right. So what happens within this experiment is that we end up switching it and saying we have a nucleus. Right. A super dense nucleus that holds all the protons. That's what's causing the repulsion. That's why we see those bouncing back. Right. Again, we have to say that there must be some other particle there to hold the protons there. Okay, without that particle, the protons should fly away from each other and we don't have a nucleus. Okay, an idea of scale. Okay, to get an idea of how big the nucleus is in comparison to the atom. So when we talk about atom size, we're talking about the outermost part of the atom, which is going to be the electrons. Okay, so if we look at an atom, the diameter is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So really, really, really small. Okay, but that's roughly the size of the atom. That's the outermost electrons. Okay? The diameter of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13. Well, 8 and 13, that's only a difference of 5. How big could that be? Okay? Like I'm 6 feet, so 5 feet, you know, like a foot. That's not that big a deal. Okay? Powers of 10 really mess with this. If we say the atom is the size of the superdome, so a massive football stadium, the nucleus is a marble in the center of that. The majority of the atom is empty space. Okay. This is a pretty drastic differential here. Recognize that and acknowledge it when you think about the size of the atom. Okay. He theorized again the addition of or the existence of a neutron. That neutron was discovered by James Chadwick. Okay. Um, so Chadwick is the neutron. Don't worry about his experiment because I don't know anything about it. Okay? A neutron is equivalent to a proton in all things except for charge. Okay? So a neutron has the exact same mass as a proton, okay? but it has no charge. Okay? This started off with Thompson, who had Rutherford as a student. Guess who Rutherford had as a student? Chadwick. They all kind of fed each other the information down the line. Okay? Our subatomic particles, so this is a big summary in, in our red box. We need to know this. Okay? Everything in that red box you need to have memorized and be able to manipulate and use. We've got our symbols for our electron, E4. Electron, right? Electron begins with E. Okay. P4, proton, neutron, N. Notice that in the upper right-hand corner, we've specified something. What did we specify? The charge for each of those particles. Okay? The charge will always get specified in the upper right-hand corner. Okay? We need to know the location of those things. The electrons are always outside the nucleus. Protons and neutrons are inside. The electrons are negative. Protons are positive. The neutrons have no charge. The next one comes down to mass. The proton and neutron are defined as one. Okay, one what? If I said what was my mass and I stepped on a scale and it said one, what is the unit of that one? Okay, you might say pound. I don't weigh one pound. Okay, kilograms, tons. I don't weigh one ton either. But there's always a unit. If we look here, do they associate a unit? No, that's why it says relative mass. The unit associated with this is atomic mass unit, which is really if I stepped on the balance and it said one, I am now defining that me personally am the mass, which means when you step on the balance, it's going to say less than one because I'm pretty sure I'm heavier than all of you. Okay. So you would all be at some number less than one. We've established that mass as an arbitrary system Protons are defined as one. Neutrons, having the identical properties to a proton, will also be one. What is the mass of an electron? Can someone say that number for me? Yeah, I don't know how to say it either, actually. I was just curious. Uh, 1 over 1,836. Okay. Anybody want to memorize that? <coughs> No one wants to memorize that. Okay, well then what should we memorize instead? Because we said this is important to memorize. Is that a really small number or a really big number? 
really small number. Okay? So this is roughly saying that when I step onto that scale and it tells me my weight, and if I pluck a single hair out of my head, okay, does the hair have mass? Yeah. If I pluck that single hair out of my head and then drop that hair, does my weight change? I mean, technically, yeah, because the, the hair had mass. Okay, has anybody tried that? You step on the balance, I really need to lose some weight. Rip. <laughs> No, that wasn't enough. Okay. You're, don't do that, by the way. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay. Your hair, the relative mass of your hair to your body is not in the same ballpark, just like here. Which means we can say the weight of my hair was zero. What is the mass of an electron? Zero. Okay. You need to have those memorized. We will then use these throughout the semester. Okay. They become implied in all of our calculations, both in mass and with the charge. Okay. So as our Chapter 4 Scientist Summary, we've got several scientists that were cool. Dalton, Thompson, Millikan, Curie, Rutherford. What was Dalton? Atomic theory, his five rules. Okay, go back and look at those five rules and say, did we invalidate any of those with these later discoveries? Yes, we did. What was Thompson? Subatomic particles, and in particular, electrons. <laughs> Using what? A cathode ray tube. We could also remember vacuum associated with that. Millikan. Okay, that was the oil drop experiment. He determined the exact charge on electrons which was some number that we're not memorizing. Curie. Alpha particles, so our radioactive particles. Rutherford. Our modern model of the atom with a nucleus. Okay, Using what? Gold foil. So what we just walked through there in probably less than a minute was what we just spent most of the lecture talking about. Mm. Okay. There's facts, and then there's the history behind the facts. Okay. Atomic notation. Now that we have our basic elements that put together our atoms, we now want to organize that and explain how that applies to our periodic table. So we'll come up with the atomic number, which we've defined as Z. Okay. This is the number of protons in the nucleus. Okay. So if I look at hydrogen, hydrogen has one proton. Helium has two protons. Lithium has three protons. Beryllium has four. Boron, five. Carbon, six. Phosphorus. Phosphorus, 15. Phosphorus was P. Yeah, I was being annoying and made you jump. Okay. Where is the atomic number found on our periodic table? In the top right-hand corner. God, I don't have to memorize another fact. Notice in the middle of our periodic table, they show BR floating in there, big BR. Upper right-hand corner of that big BR, what do they say? 35, and then they have a little arrow, and that arrow says? Number. Atomic number. Use the key. You don't have to memorize where the atomic number is on the periodic table. It's given to you. Okay? The total number of protons and neutrons in our nucleus is defined as the mass number. Okay? Well, mass. What particles, what subatomic particles had mass? Protons and neutrons. That's why our mass number is the sum of the, or the protons and the neutrons. Okay. We take a look at our key up on the periodic table. Does it say anything about mass number? It says atomic weight. Does it say mass number? No. Why? Atomic weight and mass number are related but not the same thing. Okay. So now the next part is how would we put this all together? Okay, so one option is to organize it like our periodic table is organized. And it turns out it's not organized that way. 
right? What this notation is actually is not atomic notation, it's nuclear notation. Notice in the atomic number and the mass number, we don't mention electrons at all. All I'm caring about is the protons and neutrons, which are only located in the nucleus. This notation is used almost exclusively by nuclear chemists or nuclear physicists, people dealing with radiation. And radiation is all about the nucleus. So the more protons and the more neutrons in the nucleus, the more likely it generates radiation. So if I'm one of those people and I want to look at a notation and allow me to say, yep, that one's radioactive, the first thing that I want to see is not the atomic number, but it's the mass number. It's what is everything in the nucleus. So when I look at the notation, my mass number shows up in the upper left-hand corner, followed by the symbol, and then in the lower left-hand corner, I have the atomic number. Is the atomic number necessary? Okay, what is the atomic number? It's the number of protons, right? Okay. How many protons does carbon have? Six. Six. How many protons does titanium? It's a harder one, TI? 22. 22. Did I tell you what the atomic number was in that question? Did I tell you the number of protons? How did you figure it out then? Because you just said the atomic number is super important to write. How did you figure it out based on me merely saying TI? Uh, you looked at the periodic table. Because you're a chemist, and what do chemists have? The periodic table. We always have it. Do I have one on my person right now? Yes. At all times, I have a periodic table because I'm a freaking chemist. That's what we do. Is the atomic number strictly necessary? No, because the symbol will tell me the atomic number by merely looking at the periodic table. So the atomic number becomes less important to include. Unless, of course, I want to be like, is this the atomic notation? In which case, I have to know the mass number is in the upper left, the atomic number is in the lower left, followed by the symbol. Okay. And with that, we'll look at an example of it Thursday. Thursday.